Hello, everybody. A warm welcome to another interview on Wisdom from North. I'm Janneke, and if you're new to my channel, welcome here. Here you'll find inspirational content within spirituality, metaphysics, and personal development, and interviews with amazing thought leaders all over the world. And I would love for you to subscribe to my channel. You do that below, and if you click the bell button, then you get notifications of any new videos that I have. Today, I'm truly honored and thrilled to be here with Dr. Sue Mortar. For more than 30 years, Dr. Sue Mortar has been teaching doctors, clients, and patients innovative approaches to integrative medicine based in quantum science and energy medicine. She's also a best-selling author of The Energy Codes, The Seven-Step System to Awaken Your Spirit, and she's also the host of Gaia TV's A Healing Matrix. Now, let's meet Dr. Sue Mortar. Mm. Hello, Sue. How are you today? And welcome. Hello. I'm absolutely delighted to be here, and I look forward to seeing where we get to go with our conversation. So, um, I'm uh, I'm always happy to to help steward this conversation, and uh, it is what matters most in life, in my opinion. Uh, when people are trying to truly understand their full potential and what what is happening here uh, beyond what meets the eye, so let's dig in. Yes, and I have so many topics that I want to cover today because I have been digging into your YouTube channel and I know you speak about so many different topics. So yeah. we're going to get into energy, frequencies, abundance, uh, and more. But before that, your story is quite interesting because you were a regular doctor and then today you work with energy medicine. And I know you also had some sort of an awakening 20 years ago, uh, and you found this inner freedom that you're now teaching others how to find. And I would love for you to share that story of where you started and how you came where you are today. Well, sure. I was, um, I was actually raised in an environment where my father was a pioneer in, in what is now called energy medicine. He was looking into uh, the research of quantum science and how it was repositioning our understanding of what, what is real and what creates a, a, an individual's reality and how that relates to people's health. Um, if we're perceiving something as stressful, it has a very different effect on our system, clearly, than if we're perceiving that same thing as maybe something that's going to teach me something or, or leaning in with curiosity or just, you know, being um, open to possibility. Once we draw a conclusion about something having been negative in our lives, our body has no choice but to respond as if that's the case. So I grew up inside of those kinds of conversations and the scientific research behind that was kind of my dinner table conversation. So, so that piece was in my reality, but I really hadn't had the experience of uh, our true potential until I uh, began some ancient meditation practices and uh, was learning to meditate. As I was learning to meditate, I instantly started having these transcendental, multidimensional experiences about who I was and what we're actually uh, being here on this planet. So it was... Um, quite a reality shift for me, even though I knew about principles like you create your own reality or your thoughts, you know, influence your health and vitality and limiting beliefs are a tremendous impact on our, on our body's ability to self heal. So I, I awakened inside of meditation to this state of consciousness that was so exalted. I, I was above the earth uh, to the point that the earth was about the size of a marble. And I was I was descending into it as a ray of light. I was me, and this is kind of just, a, this is what was just mind bending for me, was that I was me, but I was not in a body. I had free will, I could look up or down or to the left or to the right, um, but I could see 360 degrees uh, actually spherically in every direction at the same time if I just settled and, and did that. Um, 
I was was free freely taking breaths whenever I wanted to take a big breath or a small breath. And what I realized was that when I took a big breath in, this beautiful pink iridescent blanket of a horizon would rise up and just fall down every time I exhaled back to its resting place and and rise up on my inhale and just you know lower down again. And it it had a profound effect on on my understanding of who we are and and what we're doing here. I was in a light, it was, I could see such a brilliant light. It was 10 times brighter than the brightest day in the desert I had ever seen. And it wasn't that I wanted to be away from this light, it was that I knew this was what we really are. So it was welcomed, it was welcomed, this, this brilliance. And, and I knew that everyone was this, that this wasn't just me and that this is what humanity is doing. And I also knew these two things. Every time I took a breath, this brilliant light was becoming love, what we call love. It was becoming this energy that we call love and that we were bringing this to the planet uh, to whatever degree we would allow ourselves to do. And in that state, there was absolutely nothing missing. There was nothing broken. There was nothing to become. There was nothing wrong. Uh, it was completely complete and whole. And I was fulfilled and satiated and knew that I had always been there. And I knew that every one of us uh, was, was, was actually in this same disposition and orientation as well. We just aren't aware of it. And so you know, I came down out of that state and my life was changed forever. I just had to begin to clarify, what does this mean? Why does this happen with me? What am I supposed to do with my patients? Is this, you know, somehow going to have an effect on how I treat people and uh, meaning in the clinic, treat them and, and treat them in general as well, uh, because I now had a new understanding of of what is really happening here. So fortunately, as a scientist, I was uh, prepared to investigate this. And so the next 10 years, I turned my life into a living laboratory and tried to figure out how to return to that state on command and, um, and then what to do with that as I did and in what ways might I make a difference for humanity's ability to heal themselves because my migraine headaches, which was the reason that I began meditating, went away and I began healing a scoliosis in my body as, as I proceeded to, to truly investigate how to return to this exalted state of consciousness. So, so it's been quite a ride. Wow. Wow. Thank you for sharing that. That's amazing. And I, I get curious of how spiritual the universe uh, really works, because I know some people get these kinds of experience by grace. I remember I went to India many years ago to this ashram, and they taught me that you can get these spiritual uh, experiences either through work, 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 and practice, practice, or it just happens. And it's so interesting that it just happened with you, and then you sort of found a way to do it again. And I'm curious about that. Is that really possible uh, that we can get these the same kind of experiences again? And I'm, I'm curious how you discovered the way or that cold. Absolutely. So I began trying to make it happen the way that I would have made anything else happen in my life, right? You just try. And so you try harder if it doesn't happen. And then you get up earlier and you try longer and you do all the things that I was used to doing. And absolutely, of course, none of that would work. And I began to recognize that it was when I wasn't trying, but that I was aligning myself and, 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 and preparing myself to be available to that happening again. But I would stop trying all at the same time that's when things would start to open up. So I began recognizing that there were some things that I were, was doing each time that this would open up again um, that no one had taught me about at the beginning. So I had to figure it out. And it took me quite some time to figure out all the 
attributes of my own disposition that I was activating at the same time, like with how relaxed was I? How present was I? How slow was I breathing? What kind of vibrations were going through my system, through my thoughts? And I was toning at the time. I was chanting a repetitive chant when it opened up the first time. So I became curious about the chant and what happens with these vibrations when we move them through the body and how does that relate to energy medicine? And, and healing and what's going on here. So, so I began just codifying as things would work for me. Then I would share them with my patients and my patients started getting better faster and they started staying better longer in between their treatment sessions with me. And so I knew I was onto something. And so as I would share these things and those people would become really focused on aligning with some of these practices that they were having, you know, uh, stress relief, they were healing faster, they were, they were, they were not no longer depressed, their anxiety was being helped and all sorts of practical things like that. But on another note, people were starting to have an, a greater sense of self and a greater belongingness in the cosmos, in the whole of, of the manifest world. And they began to have a different a shape shift on who they perceived themselves to be, regardless of their story from their past and the things that they had been through and the, the, the surviving that they had done or or what what have you. And and so then it really got my attention that that we weren't just trying to heal we were actually revealing to ourselves a greater version of who we are. And when people started tapping into that, they started healing things that they weren't even trying to heal, things they weren't even focused on, things that they hadn't really realized were in their top 10 things that they would love to have be different in their lives on every level, not just physically, but emotionally and mentally and relationally. And from a standpoint of being able to manifest uh, you know, their desires in the world and have, have it work. So I began to just become enthralled with that. And so your question was, is it really possible to return to that state? Absolutely. Is it really possible to teach ourselves into that state, to train our minds, to allow for such expansion to occur? Yes. One just has to be truly, deeply, what I would say, more than curious. It requires a bit of a, of a, a heartfelt devotion and open heartedness, not just a flippant, yeah, I'd like to like to meet that man or I'd like to get that job or, you know, it's like, mm, it's more than that. And it's, it's deeper than that. It's more meaningful than just trying to manifest material, externally oriented things. However, those things have, have certainly shown up in people's lives that are, that are working with me in this way, but that can't really be the impetus. It can't be the inspiration. It really needs to be like, hey, I really want to know who I am, what my purpose on this, on this earth is, and what my life really is. And uh, and how can I take charge of that? How can I play an active role in delivering uh, my full potential and my for a full life experience? And when when someone's come from is that they open wide up and and healings happen in so many ways. It's it's just such a beautiful thing to witness. Yeah, and I'm thinking perhaps we also need to be ready to have such an experience, like the ego is very impatient and perhaps want to have these experience, but maybe we're not ready because I'm thinking that uh, it's also important to be in your body uh, and be grounded uh, because when you open up to these altered states, if you're not grounded, maybe it cannot be uh, healthy. And I know you speak a bit about embodiment as well. So maybe it's, you know, the, the spirit is actually uh, preparing you as well for it, that you, you don't get these experiences if you're not ready to actually experience them. Yes, this is a beautiful question and, and perspective. And I, I want to say that embodiment and integration and groundedness is how it happens. It's so fascinating because this opened in my life and I wasn't living in my body. I wasn't in my body and it blew my circuits when it happened. I mean, I lit up, I was wondering if I had a I do have an image here. I'll just show you a, a little picture here that's kind of like what happened for me, if that's okay. It's kind of, yeah. I, I use this when I'm teaching some of my courses, but 
I, we basically think this is who we are down here, living on the earth, walking around with our five senses and doing the best we can. And I lit up here in this higher state of consciousness and I could see the earth beneath me. Um, it was much more extended than this poster is, but, um, but this, this is what is accessible to us uh, as us. And this is who we are. And this is a project that we're doing. We are here truly coming into a body so that we can have a full life. But most of humanity thinks this is who we are and that one day we're going to connect with this or that we're asking for guidance or hoping for this or something along those lines. And the reason we don't get here is because we already are here and we have to kind of flip it over. So I refer to that in my book about the quantum flip. It's this reversal of living as that spirit self and that our job is to come into a body. So I, I couldn't get back into that experience until I got in my body. I tried and tried and tried to reproduce the experience and I never could. So my work was really about how do I embody what I'm already aware that I am? How do I become that here in this flesh and bone and walk around on this planet as that? And the egoic mind can't do that. So we have to surrender the egoic mind, but in the process, the way I work with it, of learning how to build the neurocircuitry to come into this body and to truly establish ourselves here fully, a byproduct of that is that we heal because when we're not utilizing all of our faculties, when we're not awake to all that we are, we think we need to be healed from the outside in. And so what I'm teaching people is no, 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 it comes from the inside out, hands down. All healing always comes from inside the body. It doesn't come from the pill. It doesn't come from the radiation. It doesn't come from the surgical procedure. It comes when the body prioritizes and begins to do so. It begins to awaken into its proper function. So everything that I'm teaching people is how to do that. So integration is key to awakening. And people think that, no, I just want to awaken and then integrate it. But it, that's when it has to happen by grace. But if we reverse that and start integrating and integrating and building the circuitry, the electromagnetic energy circuitry and the neurocircuitry to perceive all that we really are, so that this one down here can really perceive this magnificence being that we truly are requires neurocircuitry. We have to build greater awareness of the truth of how our system works and what we are. So that's what I'm teaching people how to do. So a byproduct of it is um, the ego parts and softens because of building the circuitry of the essential self, the true self. The ego is like a layer on top of that that was created for protective purposes in the course of our lives. And so we have to peel that back and, and then kind of consume it and let it go to work for us instead of trying to protect and unfortunately then therefore contain us. Um, it contains us in our protective vessel. So we have to learn that we don't have to protect ourselves, that we are actually not needing protection. We are actually quite robust and quite free if we allow that to be true. But it's very difficult for the ego mind, the protective personality. I call it the protective personality because no one likes to have an ego. Um, but people don't mind having a protective personality. So I call it the protective personality. And we get quite a lot of really good work done uh, in terms of that. Um, but it is... Also, I would say that only the ego doesn't like to have an ego. So, um, you know, just keep that in mind. And then once one recognizes that there is ego play in their life, the very first thing that the ego wants to do is get rid of that ego that's so bad. And really what I'm teaching people is that there's nothing wrong with any part of us. It's just parts of us that are trying their best on their own uh, without integration to protect us and to do the best they can. So. It's just a timeout, like, let's pull all this together and let it work in our favor. And it will, because the system is built to do that. So, so embodiment, integration, groundedness, you bet. Um, but they aren't two separate things. Me and my ego are the same. I just have to put it in its proper role so that it can serve something greater than protection or survival. Um, 
you know, strategies. So hopefully that's helpful. Yeah, very. And, and speaking of uh, not, um, I, well, uh, that we are the ego as well and not judging it. Uh, I remember you had a video about raising your vibration uh, where I found that you really described it in such a holistic, beautiful way that I really got it. Uh, and I wanted to ask you if you could share a bit about it, because a lot of the time in the spiritual community, we speak about energy and vibration and raising our vibration. How do we raise our vib vibration? And we have the lower vibrational emotions and the higher ones. And I think it can be like this uh, strive to just feel the positive feelings, uh, which don't lead us uh, anywhere, actually. Mm. So would you like to share a bit about what this racing vibration is all about and how we actually do it uh, by accepting all of who we are? Beautiful question. So, so the, we have to realize that everything is energy. Everything is energy, including us, that everything in the whole of creation is just energy vibrating at different frequencies. And when people are not well and vital and strong and robust and creative and feeling joy and love and able to share it easily, then it means that they're vibrating at a disintegrated, in a disintegrated way at a uh, a lower or dissonant vibrational frequency. They're, they're not dialed in to all that they are. So then people get the idea, I need to raise my vibrational frequency so that I can be healthier and more vital and happier and, and think smarter and clearer, more clear and with greater ingenuity. And, and, and that is true, but people then try to just be positive and they'll step over whatever they might authentically actually be feeling that is real for them just to go for this positive, you go get it, push the river, make it happen. Don't let anybody tell you you can't. And that kind of thing that used to be very popular in terms of personal development or even in spiritual development. And, and what quantum science is showing us is that that doesn't work. And what many people who tried to do and live that way uh, 40 years ago, uh, they'll also tell you it didn't work um, because it works to a degree. And then there is a ceiling on what that can accomplish for us because in order to step over something that I'm actually authentically feeling in this moment so that I can shoot for this higher vibration and do that instead, I have to excise a part of me or, or suppress it, maybe kick it under the bus or leave it behind in order to shoot for this goal of raising my vibration. When in actuality, we are, if you'll re recall this image, we are buoyant beings of high frequency energy. And to get into the body, we have to anchor ourselves. We have to climb down in this body and find ways to live here. So when we actually embrace or accept something, it has a deepening or grounding effect on us. See, we're not this, we are this, and this is buoyant. So we are a high vibration, but if we're not in our bodies, then we don't get to experience the high vibration that we are because it's in the body world of the third dimension that we have physical experience here on this planet. So, so we have to kind of like look at this a little differently than we used to. When we embrace our sadness, it deepens us into the system. When we totally allow ourselves to feel our, um, our worry or our anxiousness, we actually come into the body if we'll let ourselves feel it. Well, everybody says like, you know, who wants to feel that? I'm No, thank you. I don't want to feel sadness or fear or anxiety or frustration or hurt. Um, and so what I teach people to do is to just work with the energy, not the emotional state of it. That when we take our attention to the body, when sadness is here, there's a place in the body where we're more activated and it will be different for everyone and every time you experience it. It could take you into different patterns of energy relative to all of the things that were associated with why you're feeling that feeling. You could be feeling it because of an immediate situation right in this now moment, or it could be piggybacking on 
on top of something that you've suppressed for all those years that everybody told you just think positive, don't think negative. Um, you know, what if it wasn't positive and negative? What if it was just energy? And what if we were just supposed to be able to feel all of it, full rainbow, full keyboard, all the keys on the piano? Uh, what if, if, it, if we didn't have an opinion about it and a judgment about it, if we could just let ourselves feel it, what if just feeling it would actually raise our vibration? And it does. It's crazy. I never thought that actually feeling the hurt that was happening inside of someone could raise their vibration. Actually feeling it brings loving presence to the feeling of hurt, or it brings loving presence to the feeling of sadness or loving presence to the feeling of fear or anxiety, because we are loving presence. That's what we really are. We are awareness that is made of love. And when we focus that love on anything, it is changed by us. Love is a universal solvent. Anything that it is focused on dissolves in its presence. And, and our mind is how we focus attention. So if we put the loving presence that we are made of, and I'll explain that in just a moment, that onto anything, that thing is changed by our true presence with it when we connect it. So we dissolve these little packages of energy, of photons that are collected in certain co uh, configurations that are the different emotional states that we feel. So if we put our loving presence on them, they start to melt open, basically. It's the easiest way to describe it. So if I will actually allow myself to feel the sadness, the loving presence dissolves the sadness, and now there's more loving presence and zero sadness because we've unpacked the sadness, and now it's just free energy that can be utilized in a different way again kind of an ashes to ashes thing. Like we get to start over with it. So it's recycling, basically. We're recycling the energy. Instead of just trying to throw it away, we're like, hey, let me use that. There's probably something good in there for me. So it's not about the story. So I teach people how to feel in their body what is being activated. They may feel something in their gut. They may feel something in their chest. They may feel something in their throat, in their neck, in their head. It doesn't matter. We teach them how to, to connect with that and start to breathe it into the whole system instead of having it be this isolated package of energy that we keep trying not to feel, so we pack it away. But that energy packed away, it creates disease. It creates dysfunction. It creates um, cellular acidity. It lowers our vibration only because it's packed away, not because it's sadness, but because it's packed away. So we keep packing things into this energy body and the vibration of the energy body lowers because it's being so compressed. So I'm teaching people how to unpack that and allow that energy to flow again in a way that raises vibration. So in short, by embracing anger, we actually can raise our vibration. It's the embrace part that does the raising. But when we try to push the anger away and just think positively, that anger is still sitting there. Even though you can't see it, it's still there in the unconscious and the subconscious. And it's having such an effect on your ability to heal. It's crazy. It's crazy the things that we do to keep outrunning that. And uh, and crazy to continue to try when we look at how we as a species are so much less healthy than we should be, than we could be, and than we would be if we were running at our full potential and able to, able to transmute these energies into something more productive for us. So lastly, let me just say this, okay? I spoke about love being this universal solvent. If you take the unified field, this just take one second to say this, but it's very valuable for people to realize my God, the power of my own loving presence is the key that I'm looking for. So if you take the entire unified field, the zero point field, meaning if you took everything and put it together, that, that if all energies just dissolved into each other, now in spirituality, they call this heaven. In quantum science, they call it the unified field. Same conversation going on all the time, but separated by this common language, right, that, that we speak. So you put the words in different orders, that they, everybody's saying the same thing. But, you know, so that's another conversation. But, but here's the deal. When you start compressing high frequency energy, the unified field, which is pure light, that's the highest frequency energy is light and 
That's who we are at this point. We are pure light. And we're compressing ourselves down into physical form. Because when you take pure light, pure energy, and you compress it, this is a law of physics, it creates physical matter. And so that physical matter is just compressed light. So if, if we're living down inside of this compression where we've been compressing and packing all these emotional states together, it compresses us even more, too much. So when we choose love, it has an opening and a dissolving and a decompressing effect on the compressions that we've been generating over the course of our lives. And this is why. When we start compressing light toward physical matter, if you unpack that all the way out, the very first compression that happens is it creates a vibration. The unified field gets compressed. The very first compression, um, it creates a vibrational frequency. We vibrate because of compressing energy. And that vibration is the frequency we call love. That's what we call love. That's what love is. So when you are loving, you are as close to the unified field as you can be and still be in a body. It's the absolute most powerful thing that we can engage in. So we just have to love into the things that we're afraid of. That doesn't mean go love the people. First, start with loving into the parts of you that react to those people because your body is telling your mind how you're doing at mastering this whole system the way that it's designed to be utilized. So I'm hoping that that makes a little bit of sense. Wow. Uh, the big was... answer to your question. It's a little <laughs> mini course, you know, in response to your to your question here. I love that. That was highly interesting. Um, I was thinking about something that maybe someone is thinking, okay, so if I feel the feelings, I feel my shame. And then I've heard, you know, in spiritual communities that what I focus on will grow. Yeah. Perhaps people are afraid that. But if I stay in that sadness, won't I just, you know, stay longer in that sadness? Or is it that it is, no, you're actually staying in that loving energy. That's what you're actually uh, moving into, not the sadness itself, in a right. way. A great question. So, yes, I don't want to focus on it. I don't walk around focusing on sadness. I focus on the fact that I am a pure high frequency energy being. And there is an energy in my system that has not been being embraced or it never would have stuck around this long. Because as soon as I embrace it, I, it, it metabolizes. I burn it up. It burns up in the presence of my loving attention on it. Think of love as a bonfire. The bonfire of the heart is what I refer to it as. It, anything that I'm willing to put onto my heart, I'm throwing it on a fire and it's going to burn up because presence does that. It it metabolizes it. It's, it's that we've been avoiding sadness is what makes sadness so big. But if you feel it full on, for just an instant, if you feel it 100% for a short period of time, it actually has served its purpose. And it's actually an anchoring purpose that it is serving, which is a, a bit of a longer explanation than we can go into here, likely. But, but it isn't that you're walking around for days on end focusing on sadness. I'm teaching people how to use the body to, to help burn this stuff up faster. Let me show you another thing. That's what I was looking for just a second ago. Another little image that I use here. So here's how that energy at the bottom of this page, all this energy is dropping into a little system right here. This is kind of an ex a blown up version of that and magnified. This energy is dropping, all that higher frequency energy is dropping in. Here's that little system blown up. This is how it's supposed to work. We drop through the body, we hit the earth, we rise up, and we cycle around and around and around with this energy. In fact, there's not even a body there when this starts. We shoot our energy, compress our energy into physical form. It hits the earth and rises up and cycles around like this. It's an automatic thing that's happening. This is called the toric field flow. And this is bioenergetically who we are. This is what we are. We are an energy field that is doing this. So that's how it's supposed to work. It rises up perfectly and matches what's coming in. And, and it's this beautiful robust expression but here's how most people are functioning the energy comes down and hits the earth and when it starts to rise up it skips around and wobbles through and finds the path of least resistance where 
I've not embraced certain emotions or thoughts or beliefs about who I am or things that I'm doing or what it would have you many, many variations of this. And so this wobbling energy as it rises creates a distortion in the energy field. We see how this is not the same as this and it's very distorted looking. Now this person is standing inside this distorted field looking out and they see a distorted reality. They see one that doesn't love them when it's not true because the whole of creation is made of love and so are we. So there's nothing but love happening. And the question in our worlds is, you know, how much of that are we allowing ourselves to pay attention to or to participate in? So we have to be this high frequency energy being in our consciousness and look into the sadness and feel the sadness. And when I'm doing that, it is with an intention of, of fully allowing the sadness to complete its purpose. It's happening in my life for a reason, because two different people might experience the same event and one will have a happy response and the other one will have a confused response or one will have a sad response and the other will get angry. And it's it's about our come from like, what are we looking for so that we can metabolize it so that we can build the circuitry across these gaps so that we can heal this and start functioning like this. So what I'm teaching people to do is to close this gap, close these gaps so that this wobble is no longer necessary. So to answer your question, I just wanted to give that as an understanding around, around the picture, but to, <clears throat> to really speak to what you're asking is, it isn't that you become sad. The focus isn't, uh, I'm gonna let the sadness just take over. The focus is I'm going into this and I'm gonna embrace it because it wouldn't be showing up in my life if it wasn't serving something. There's a reason that this is here. And we have to stop avoiding those kinds of ideas that there's no, you know, no purpose to anything that's happening. If there were purpose to everything that was happening and we were embracing that, we would be living a different life. That is what I began to do 20 years ago when this thing started opening up in me so vastly. I recognize that every single thing that crosses our path is crossing our path for a reason. And there are no exceptions to that. And even more so, it's all serving me. And when I started to embrace it that way, like this thing that I can't stand is happening, it's actually happening for a reason. And the reason is good and it's in my favor. That's the, the equivalent to what unfolded for me in that exalted state and returning and returning and returning and living from that exalted state allows me to see these things in this way now. But for many years, it was like, there's no way, there's no way you're going to tell me that that thing is serving me because it stinks and it shouldn't have happened. And that this person's being a bully or they're being abusive or they're being abrasive. And how am I supposed to think that that's in my favor? Well, what I, what I then realized was I was waking up to the me that I love, and it was because that abrasive or abusive thing was happening. And I came inside and felt what I was feeling, and all of a sudden it started to build this awareness that, oh my God, there's nothing that can happen in my life that I can't become present to, and I feel invincible in the face of that. It's been amazing. So I'm not saying that we have to have abusive and abrasive things happen in order to wake up, but I am saying if you've had that in your life or you have it now, if you look at it from this perspective, it starts changing everything. You start realizing, oh my God, there's nothing I can't handle. So if there's nothing I can't handle, I'm really not afraid. So now I'm actually joyful because I'm not spending all my energy being afraid and protective. And as I'm joyful, I'm adventurous and I get an expanded life experience and all of a sudden my vibration raises right in the face of abuse or abandonment, my vibration raises. So the idea that I can't get my vibration up if I, if I think negative thoughts or if I'm in a negative environment is completely a limited perspective on how we could be living our lives. And so inside my coursework, I take a little more time to explain that, but you're asking deep questions. So I'm giving you deep answers. And I love so, that. Okay, I'm learning. So. I'm learning so much. I love this. Um, I would like to ask you about purpose. Um, I have seminars and events about purpose, aligning with your purpose. And it took me a long time before I found my purpose. I thought it was to become a musical theater artist. 
Uh, I was a child star in Norway and I lost my voice uh, in my 20s and I found another way, but I fell into a depression, didn't know what to do. I really thought that that was my purpose, like since I was seven years old. Uh, mm. But uh, I found my voice in another way. Uh, I found self-love and I started Wisdom from North and I'm really curious about purpose. So what is your perspective? You talk a lot about potential, you know, our potential. And I get very curious about how big our potential is and whether we all have a specific purpose from your perspective and what that looks like in a way. Yeah. So another good question. So so what I know about purpose is that our true purpose is to awaken as our true magnificent self. And it's not about what we do. It's about what we know, what we perceive, what we experience. It's about who we get to be on the inside, looking out through these eyes into the world, what we feel inside this skin emanating out into the world and the difference that we can make when we find that or even a portion of it is exponentially larger than anything we would have contributed to the world uh, from the outside in. I think I, I talk about it like when we land here, we kind of splat and when we splat, our mind goes one way, our body goes another way, our breath goes another way, and we don't know who we are. And we get hooked into the mind thinking that's who we are because the mind is the, the most refined tool that we have at that point because it can say good or bad, right or wrong, survive, you know, pay attention to the big people, the ones who feed you, mind, you know, pay attention there, do what they say, and that kind of stuff. The problem is we stay attached to the mind so much that we get hooked in and we become identified as the mind and the mind isn't who we are it's a tool that's supposed to be serving us instead of instead of us being absorbed in it so the mind is like on us like this and we have to get it off of us so i would contend that when your voice went away in your 20s it was in your highest interest that it did because there was a deeper path for you not that singing and being in musical theater isn't a deep path it can be exponentially profound for people, but your path was to take away this gift that you had and say, okay, now who are you? Okay, now who are you? Take this and this and this away. Now who are you? And so when that happens, I just smile because I know that person <laughs> is in for a great ride. There, and not that we have to suffer. We don't have to lose these things in order to wake up. But when we do lose them, it's definitely an invitation because our purpose is to wake up. And big beings will do so when they're ready. If they're here in this lifetime and it's time for them to realize this is not who I am. This is something that gets to serve me instead of decide who I am. It doesn't get to serve me anymore because if I just do this, if I get it off, it's going to come right back on. And I'm going to get it off and it's going to come right back on. I have to get it in a different role. So this is what I'm teaching people inside of the coursework that I teach is how do you get the mind in the right role? Because our purpose is to awaken as the true essential self. The soulful self is what I reference it in the book, but that's everyone's purpose on this planet. So the methodologies, they are, there's a myriad of methodologies. The ways that it's going to unfold in anyone's life is different. Someone might be, you know, have been put up for adoption. Someone else might have lost their parents through trauma. Someone else might have had an abusive parent who they had to work it out and figure out, whoa, what, who am I and what is love and what is family and how does it work? And, but it's, it's all starting to awaken them. Someone else might be born into a family of wealth and have to witness the dysfunction that happens even in the side of inside of a family that is, you know, tremendously wealthy and and put it together in their mind. Like, wait a second, we're supposed to have it all. This is what this is what we do. And this is how it rolls, only to find out that oftentimes, you know, there's a lot of externalized um, focus and uh, into the material world, et cetera. So everyone is working with this in a different way. People are, are learning it through abuse or through abandonment or from just regular old living. And to finally realize that their regular old voice is actually the one that everyone is seeking and that they're more than enough, not, not less than, but abundant. So, so our purpose is to awaken to the reality that we are not the mind. And it's the toughest thing in someone's life, especially if they have a really bright mind, 
especially if they've accomplished a lot with that bright mind and they've been very quick to make decisions and they, they understand everything and they think they know. You know, I work with people that, that are brilliant people in the world, you know, running Fortune 500 companies, CEOs of, of, of large companies and organizations, and they've been rewarded for how much their mind knows how to make distinctions and judgments and discernments. But that's not our purpose on the planet. Our purpose is to awaken to the one that's underneath that, that is loving and kind and precious and rare and that is giving and forgiving and is compassionate and that is the self healer and the creative essence that that will allow us to feel the freedom no matter what we're doing, no matter what our vocation is, to feel free inside of it and to embrace everything that is happening in our lives as, as something that is an amazing experience instead of something that's just, you know, taking me out of the game. So our purpose is to awaken to our true magnificent self, the creator that we truly are. And I don't mean creator like God, but I do mean creator like creating your entire reality. And it is a collaborative. And inside of the quantum field, creator and God and self are actually a lot more unified as one presence than one might think at, at first glance. So I do blend all those boundaries and weave it together for people, realizing, allowing people to realize there's only one thing happening here. And it's, it's nature awakening to itself. And we are playing a part of that. We are playing a role. And every person who does it just a little bit makes it easier for the next guy who comes along to try to do that because we're changing what is acceptable inside of human consciousness. We're changing what we're capable of. We're, we're opening to the possibilities that, that we are much more powerful than we ever thought we were to break through perceptions that, that we have to find our purpose in the world. It's not out there. Our purpose is in here. And when we connect those dots, it rolls out in whatever way you pick or in all the ways that you pick. I'm amazed at how much more of a contribution I'm making in the world than when I thought I was doing what I was supposed to do by being a good doctor in a good clinic as a good citizen, trying to show up for my good patients, you know, and make this thing work. All of a sudden, there's an exponential um, expression of that same intention. And, and it's so ironic because it includes people embracing things that they used to be trying to get away from or heal from, uh, when actually so often that problem is the solution. They just don't know how to look at it in the right way. There's another long answer to your question. Wow, I love it. This has been a profound conversation. And you've given such a, a, a wholesome uh, um, uh, explanation to all these topics. And I love how, when I see the big picture. And I loved how you shared about uh, that we are light, uh, that that is actually what I am. Uh, and the embodiment is so important and the love part of it, because it seems like as humans, we have it the other way around, the wrong way around that I should work more on myself. I should fix this. There's something wrong with me. I shouldn't feel like this. And then it's the opposite. It's the love. It's the, uh, is it is that I am my own solution and everything is in me as long as I embrace uh, what's within me that's that's the solution that's the way and some somehow we just resist that resist that it should be love and light because it seems so airy fairy in a way and that's not what we experience in our reality or I would say it depends on what level of consciousness you're at of course but what we see on the news it, we we don't see this love. We, we see the illusion uh, of life, like uh, Albert Einstein was saying that, you know, it is a persistent uh, illusion, uh, but it's not real, yeah. but that's what we perceive because that's what we learn. Uh, and it's just so beautiful to be reminded of it's all about love. It's all about light. That's who we are. And we have an infinite potential. So I really love your, your message and it just needs to, uh, you know, be shared uh, again and again, like you're saying, 
when more people wake up, they help the other person help up. And that's how I think we evolve. Uh, but we still have a way to go because the illusion is very strong and you had your experience. And now I love that you're teaching others how they can have those experiences because I think it's important to have experiences, not just yeah. like think that there might be something more, but actually feel it. Yes, like indeed. It's, yeah. it's ultimately all about the experiential being. And when we can experience self-acceptance, self-love, being the self, see, we are love. The truth of us is love. It's, we're pure awareness, and when it's packed into a body, it shows up like love when that, in that compression. So, so when we are experiencing the true self and just being ourselves, love is here. People say, I need to learn to love myself, which is a dualistic con you know, concept. There's me that needs to love and the self that it needs to love. There's two of me. And so that's the problem. We'll always be caught in this dualistic reality and not be embodied. We won't be merged or, or anchored or integrated. And so, so I'm saying, be yourself because yourself is love. And when you are busy being your true self, you will have the most loving, amazing, adventurous experience in this life. And I don't mean for that statement to sound so simplistic, like, oh yeah, we heard that in elementary school. There was a poster in my fifth grade class that said, you know, fearlessly be yourself. And, um, you know, why did it take so long to figure out what that meant? And, and that's, that's what I'm teaching people how to do is just, is to drop inside, build the neurocircuitry to stay on the self instead of being pulled off. You know, when someone walks in the room um, that, that trips a trigger in you, your energy goes off of you and onto them. Now you're giving them your energy. So, so I could say, just claim it back. And I do. But then I teach people how to build the circuitry to keep it there to keep your energy here so that it's not leaking out and, and becoming weakened and splatting and dispersing all the time and, uh, and causing us to feel intimidated. When our energy isn't compressed and quickened in this way and organized, we feel intimidated and, and lacking and like we're not enough in some way and, and we hesitate and we hedge and we doubt and we second guess. And then we start running in our head trying to figure out what's wrong. All of that sensation starts because we're having a different experience of self than we truly should be having, than we're meant to be having. And so it's about gathering that energy back. So when someone walks in the room or you start thinking a thought and your energy goes there, just call it back. And then even better yet, ask yourself, where in my body do I feel an activation when that person comes through the door? Does it get me here? Does it get me here? Does it get me here? You know, what happens? And squeeze it on the inside, just hug it, hug that area, because that focuses the mind. And the next thing you know, you're able to breathe, and please do, breathe up and down through the channel of the body and allow that energy that's being activated to start to melt open. Because this is why when that person walks in the room that impacts you so much, the reason they impact you is not because they're a bad person. And it's not even if they're abusive or abrasive, it's not because of the abuse or the abrasiveness. It's because you don't have the circuits to handle them, right? So what's happening when you feel the knot in your stomach or the lump in your throat or the tightness in your chest, it's because this energy is rising and it's hitting this area. It's hitting it and then having to go around it. It's hitting it and then having to go around it. So when it hits this gap, and rolls around it, I feel a knot and I feel, ooh, I feel like somebody just kicked me in the stomach. Ah, now I'm onto it. Now I know why you're in my life because I apparently have a gap right here and you're helping me fill it. Thank you, I think. Yes, thank you, right? So here's what you do. When you feel the knot in your stomach, you squeeze it back you're like, ah, got it. Thank you for the medicine that's showing me where I don't have the circuits in my system. So now I'm gonna squeeze that and start breathing up and down this channel because when i when i when i breathe up and down this channel while i'm squeezing that area i start to carve a pathway right through this instead of having to go around it i start to channel the energy i'm insisting on it so by squeezing it and just breathing up and through the this central channel so you you would inhale from the earth to your core and then exhale out over your head 
and then inhale from over your head to your core and then exhale into the earth. And then just keep repeating that, keep repeating that. And I teach people how to anchor themselves in the body so that it's really concentrated and carving this pathway for this energy to flow. Because as soon as it flows, we are integrated and we are embodying. And we then have enough wherewithal when this person comes in the room to not lose our personal power or lose touch with our wisdom or lose touch with our voice in the world or, or the idea that, that there's something happening here that's, that's going to be in service to me if I don't get afraid and run away or don't have to get angry and, you know, and fight my way. Um, I can integrate and embody. And when I'm integrated and embodied, I see that I don't have to do any of those defensive protective measures because it's all OK. And it's all actually here trying to show me where I need to build these circuits. How can I be more here? And because when this is happening, this person is not able to drop down into this body with all this magnificence. We're not able to get in because these distortions are densities. And this is a high vibration. We have to raise the vibration here so that this can drop in and match it. And that's what we're doing when we close in the gaps. We create the perfect vessel that's vibrating in a state of presence and awareness and availability. And in the midst of that, there's nothing that we can't handle. Beautiful. Thank you so much for everything you shared today and tangible tools and this overview of things. And I, I just love this. I know people are really going to appreciate this. Uh, this was amazing. Thank you so much for all the work you're doing and for giving time uh, to me today to show up on Wisdom from North. Thank you so much, Sue. Absolutely. My great pleasure. And thank you for watching, everybody. Much light from Norway and the U.S. Bye-bye.